procurement. My name is Neil Rodriguez, and at this point I'll be handing off the presentation to uh, my coworker, Rob Tazanari. Thank you, Neil. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to this peer call. Uh, my name is Rob Tazanari. I'm the Senior Technical Director for National RTAP. Um, Neil, next slide, please. Um, just briefly, we do an introduction uh, about this. Uh, we we'll do a, have a presentation, and then um, a brief presentation that is, and then we're going to open it up for conversation. Just to remind you, this is a peer-to-peer -peer call. It's really not a webinar. Um, what we're hoping is that um, you know we'll get some discussion going between our presenter as well as um, our audience. Next slide, Neil, please. Our presenter today is Mike Labello. He's principal of Main Street Connections. Mike is our procurement specialist that we use um, when we receive our procurement, as well as he's our specialist um, for Procurement Pro. We also have um, Frank Thomas. He's out of um, the state, great state of Washington, uh, Oregon. Um, he is with a transit agency, Northeast Oregon Public Transit, and. Um, uh, Frank will be coming in uh, just to answer some questions or uh, give us some case studies. We also have Curtis Sims. Curtis is with the South Carolina Department of Transportation, and uh, both Frank and Curtis will be uh, providing us with some input. Um, before we if, next slide, I'm sorry, Neil. Um, before we have Mike start to present, I just had a couple of polls that we were hoping that. Um, you could answer. So this will just take a second. What I'm going to do is launch this first poll. Um, we'll keep it open for, for about a minute. If you don't mind just um, answering the poll, you'll notice that you can just um, click it to answer. Okay. And I mean, it looks like we're, a few people are still answering. Close, and that looks like that's it. Okay, so we are going to close this poll. Oops. Sorry, but it just I just went the wrong way, um, and now I can't see my screen. Okay. Um, what I'm trying to do is just post this, but I can't seem to post it. So um, right now we have seven people that are purchasing technology, 77% um, that are not uh, purchasing technology. OK, and I'm sorry, I just had one more poll. Okay, and this is just a question on the type of technology that you may be planning on purchasing. If you don't mind answering this poll, it would be great. Looks like just about everybody is closing this down. And we have about 8% um, accounting software, 64% dispatcher maintenance software, 62% computers, tablets, mobile data uh, terminals, 49% automatic vehicle locators, and 28% with fair media barcode smart card. OK, well, thank you very much for answering that poll. It's going to just help us out, National RTAP, um, as we go into the future. Uh, at this point, what I would like to do is introduce you to Mike Labello. He's our um, procurement specialist, as I had mentioned. Um, his screen should be coming up at this point. There we go. Um, Mike, it's all yours. Thanks, Rob. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and those on the West Coast, good morning. Uh, my name is Mike Labello. I'm with Main Street Connections. 
Uh, I'm a transportation professional who is smart enough to know that I will never know everything about procurement. I would say at best I'm an earnest student of procurement and I am very aware uh, that when you play in the sandbox of the FTA, you should expect change at any time and keep current federal circulars close by so you're ready to manage whatever comes up. For today's conversation, we're going to be talking about the federal procurement process that has a slight spin on technology as we do so. To start things off, uh, what we'll look to do is touch on the standard procurement protocol that I follow as a matter of practice, regardless of what I look to acquire. Everybody has their own process, I'm aware of this, and uh, for managing a procurement, there's really no set process that I know of, uh, so what I do may not exactly uh, compare to your own process, nor does it need to. Ultimately, we all seek to uh, achieve the same goal, which is the, uh, an acquisition that meets our needs, uh, a competitive price, and ultimately a, a procurement history file that would meet the expectations of the FTA, should they choose to select that one for a review. In my first slide, what I want to do is go over my procurement protocol. Again, as I said, this may not be your own practices, but um, I found it useful in my, in my own procurements. First thing I always step into is the pre-procurement preparation, uh, which is documented procurement procedures. Everybody is required to have them. Um, I generally update mine annually uh, in cooperation with the release of the uh, master agreement. Then I start a procurement history file. Um, this is similar to a, uh, pretty, pretty much to a mystery novel. It should have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And at the end of your procurement, several years later, you should be able to pull out that file and uh, the FTA should be able to review it and not have it a, uh, an unsolved mystery, so to say. The next phase that I generally undertake is the project identification phase. Uh, project planning and identification can certainly preclude um, procurement history file development because a lot of what you're doing in your initial uh, planning and identification phase is information that will ultimately go into your, into your file. Somebody trying to talk? Okay. Um, so as you're, as you're doing your planning and identification for a procurement, you tend to do an uh, informational uh, review like determining what costs may be for a particular project that you're looking to uh, procure. Those costs will ultimately become key in developing your independent cost estimate. So that's early on in your process. The, the ICE, as they call it, is one of the low-hanging fruit of the FTA. Uh, they look at it in every review, and it is a, a topic that results in a lot of findings. Your pre-planning and, and uh, identification process also helps you identify, um, as, as far as the costs go, how you're going to secure funds, what you're going to ask for from the federal government, what you're going to ask for in matching funds. So these are also pre-planning pre processes that uh, will help you move forward. Also in your project identification phase, you're looking at identifying the type of procurement that you're going to consider. In the technology world, most likely it's going to be an RFP. I, I don't recall ever seeing a, a low bid process. Uh, sole source is always uh, dangerous to approach as well. Once I've done my identification process and I know where I'm going, and I look to develop the solicitation, um, which generally consists of uh, an information for bidders package. I can have many components to it. Of course, the technical specifications, which is the most difficult portion of a development to write, uh, because it's what you're telling people you want them to develop for you. I always look to have a uh, written standards of conduct, uh, protest process, and DBE requirements included in every package. It certainly is something that the FTA will look for, and it should just be standard uh, boilerplate information to include. Contract term limitations may come into play. Uh, and, of course, federal clauses and certifications are a must. Once I've developed the solicitation and development package, I look to advertise it and then open the bidding. Um, clearly, the top one there is another high finding of the FTA, advertising without geographic preference. Once you use federal dollars, you can't just local, local, locally advertise. 
Uh, there may be an approved equal process, especially when you're developing technology. A lot of people tend to utilize existing specifications from various manufacturers, so they will have certain labels on their on their components that you can't put into an RFP. You would have to offer some type of approved equal process. If you wish for a pre-bid meeting, that can certainly occur, uh, and then there's an opening and recording process. Once you've opened and recorded everything, you get into the evaluation for responsiveness. Uh, you look at the selection criteria. You review the excluded parties list to make sure uh, they're not banned from bidding on federal, federal projects. And then you uh, start to get into your tabulation of the proposals, your cost analysis. Um, and ultimately, your goal is to award uh, the project with sufficient justification for your history file. Following along the procurement protocol, now that your solicitation has been awarded, you're pretty much administering the project. You're finalizing the contract. Uh, you're either referencing or attaching the appropriate clause and certifications. You deal with any bonding and insurance requirements. And then you, you should develop milestones and anticipated closeout procedures. Because everybody understands what TRAMS is looking for. Um, this stuff, if you take care of it during your process, it makes it a lot easier to manage uh, the project within the uh, FGA um, programs. Uh, project progress reports is just something I generally do. If there's any change orders, I always do those with a cost or price analysis. And lastly, by the closeout, I'll try to finalize the milestones, I'll begin the physical and administrative closeout procedures, uh, and, you know, and proceed to close out the project. What that ultimately results in is a procurement project history file uh, and a completed solicitation that hopefully will meet FTA standards. That is my procurement protocol, how I generally try to manage the project from uh, beginning to end. Uh, and again, as I said, you may have different procedures, but ultimately our same goal will always be to uh, meet the federal requirements and acquire a good product. Now I want to get a little bit more into the specifics of IT. Uh, so deciding on what to procure is certainly one of the, the first steps you have to take and early on in my uh, project planning and development process. Now this can take on many different aspects because there are so many different types of technology to acquire. Uh, so first you got to determine what it is you're looking to gain from the, the technology. Uh, it could be for financials, you may be dealing with your assets, um, your, your expenses, your revenues, uh, your subsidies, contracts. Uh, it could be dealing with operational tracking, such as your riders, your miles, demographics. Um, contracts are also very important in the operational tracking world because if you do have contracts, whether they're uh, Medicaid, senior, develop, uh, senior programs, or any other type of social service program, being able to track those riders um, helps you determine how you're allocating your costs across the program. Um, perhaps you're looking for asset management, another um, key word at the FTA right now. Um, tracking inventory, dealing with useful life, determining your needs assessment over the, over the next uh, 5 to 10, 15 years is important. The characteristics of your vehicles the various components you want to be able to track that stuff. That's something you may be looking to acquire technology for. Uh, certainly maintenance is uh, a highly um, sought after technology. Dealing with your PM and uh, your run of the maintenance and your facility maintenance plans, your maintenance cycle. A lot of people do look to acquire maintenance technologies to help manage that process. Um, performance measures and indicators, being able to analyze your system on the fly is something that a robust technology can offer um, to deal with your current trends, your past trends, um, and provide um, um, uh, timely information to your decision makers. Program and project management is certainly another um, topic that technology can be very useful on, reporting budgeting, providing analysis, doing long and short range planning. And of course, there's the ITS world. Uh, trip planning and management 
this is a, uh, a type of technology that is certainly can be costly. Um, some of the some of the top agencies in it, such as Rootmaster, Trapeze, and Stratagen, um, are doing a lot of work nationally right now uh, as far as managing multi-rides and even multi-agency needs. Um, this type of technology can be very useful. It's also very difficult to procure because you're often dependent on these manufacturers to tell you how to write the specs, and that can be dangerous. Uh, the next topic I wanted to touch on was where to get good information on available technology. Certainly the FTA will be a, a valuable resource <clears throat> for what's current, and uh, they'll also be able to lead you in a direction of uh, providers and uh, vendors who may be making something that's state-of-the-art right now. Organizations such as National RTAP, CCAA, APTA, and TRB um, are great resources. Uh, state advocacy groups are also a, a great resource. And I'm from New York State. We have a, an advocacy in New York State called the National Public Transit Assistant. Um, uh, NIPTA, National New York Public Transit Association. And what NIPTA does is they are an advocate for all statewide organizations. Um, their board of directors is very knowledgeable, and we often um, seek their knowledge when we're looking to do something statewide um, that can touch many, many organizations and many individuals. ATOTs are another valuable resource. Um, some may offer purchasing schedules or state contracts um, that offer IT solutions on that. Um, we also have knowledgeable staff who may have insight on functionality. And if, uh, if not, then they can usually lead you in the right direction. The purchasing schedules would have to have been uh, procured with federal standards in mind to be useful. Certainly existing manufacturers um, for IT and ITS technologies um, is another great resource. Fairbox technology is one of the leading purchases, I would say, within the industry. Database technology is is huge, whether it's web-based, uh, cloud-based, or server-based technology. JIS Platform, which is on most uh, ITS technologies, is another uh, common purpose. And of course, there are many innovative software programs out there uh, to look at. Peer-to-peer, -peer, like we're doing today, is also another valuable resource. Um, but as I said, as transportation professionals, none of us really can know everything about the industry, especially in the technology world. Uh, for the most part, we're concerned about keeping the wheels on the road, uh, keeping employees happy, and moving people from point A to point B. So the ability to become fluent in technology probably isn't going to be one of our priorities. So dealing with a nation of peers is a huge way to do things, and National Artech is certainly ahead of the curve in, in uh, meetings like this. Uh, National ITS architecture policy um, is a pretty much a requirement when you're dealing with ITS. Uh, this this offers you some insight to regional architecture that may be in place. Uh, it, it's useful as far as trying to have some type of cohesive nature with technologies within a community or within a region. Um, there's a system engineering process that goes along with it. Uh, as well as uh, U.S. DOT uh, standards for ITS. Uh, common procurement problems. This should generate a lot of discussion. Well, the most common procurement, of course, are computers, copiers, printers, things like that. Uh, generally, that's an operational purchase, although uh, many of those could be acquired as a capital purchase. Uh, depending on your situation, whether you're urban, rural, suburban, uh, and wish to spend that kind of money right? and, and spend your capital dollars in that nature. Maintenance software and fair box technology, of course, is very common. Uh, probably two of the, the most common technology purchases in the country right now. And of course, ITS, as I said, is a highly sought after um, technology. Up to with vehicle locations, uh, transit trip planning, 
scheduling, um, and another keyword of the FTA right now, mobility management. Um, as I said earlier, it can be very costly and it does have a high learning curve. The problem um, that I've noticed in, in the technology world anyways is limited training. Um, this, this tends to be a situation where the, the writing of the RFP could possibly solve this but it's not often considered in, in how you um, draft an RFP when you're trying to figure out training. A lot of the training will be determined by the vendor. So they may say, we're going to give you six weeks of training. Um, it's going to be remote uh, via web-based. It can be difficult to tackle that learning curve if training isn't taken into consideration when you write your RFP. So as I said, it does have a high learning curve, and you can I'll look at the bullet ahead of that for one of the reasons that that learning curve becomes difficult to limit training. Uh, what I've noticed is the sales pitch is more impressive very often uh, than the actual functionality of the product you're buying. Uh, the sales pitch is generally not from the technician developing it. Um, it's what they've learned by reading their, their sales material as they travel around the country telling you what you want to hear, you're trying to sell a product. So do not expect the functionality that you hear from a salesman to appear a year or two years later after you're done with the procurement. You need to understand what you're purchasing. RFP is not explicit enough. This is very common. Um, when an RFP is left to the vendor to tell you what you need, it opens the door for off-the-shelf products. Um, and, and that doesn't always complement your true need. Uh, most vendors will have off-the-shelf products. Um, some might even have overstock. And if you leave it open for them to meet your need based on simple language, they're going to probably push some of these products to you. And in the technology world, specific to transit, there's very little off-the-shelf that's going to accommodate your true need. Uh, so you want to be clear when you're writing your RFP what you want the functionality to do for you. Uh, another problem I've, I've encountered is ongoing costs for maintenance support and updates. Um, licensing fees can be certainly unpredictable. Most of the contracts I've managed or reviewed or audited, as I look at the RFP, I tend to see a request to have support and licensing fees included in the bid. So a lot of vendors will put that in there for a year or two, maybe sometimes three years of support fees and licensing fees included into the cost. And then after that, it's likely they're not getting rid of the product, so you're going to have to continue those support and licensing fees. And at that point, the cost could be volatile because you're not tied into anything. So you want to look at writing your RFP to accommodate uh, the after years. Um, the National IPS architecture is often overlooked. It's, it's, not, it's not talked about much. A lot of agencies do not know it's a requirement. Uh, and it, it does tend to get you away from you know, achieving ITS that, uh, that integrates with your surroundings, with your the region with other organizations and businesses within the region. That's really what the, uh, the, the ITS architecture requirements are all about. It's about integration um, so that you can actually work as a cohesive unit. Uh, so it's good not to overlook this. Uh, it's never come up in a review, but if it did, I think most ITS procurements would probably get a fining for, for not looking at this um, the way they should. Uh, strategies to plan and develop solicitations. I want to touch on this a little bit. Again, these are my own ideas uh, as appear on this call. This is how I look at this stuff. So they may not exactly match how you deal with things, but that's what we're here for, to talk about this and, and get ideas, get better ideas. I'd love to have better ideas. Uh, so as you look to plan and develop your solicitation, again, you know, look to existing organizations and peers. Uh, we've already done this. There are a lot of 
uh, agencies on this call who have probably performed technology procurements and have some good lessons to pass on and some good wins to pass on. And if you're if you're successful, we want to know that. And if you had trouble, we'd like to know that too, so that we can try to avoid those those pitfalls. Uh, fast use RFPs is, is a pretty common product for writing an RFP. If you know if somebody has done it in the past, you tend to ask for it. And if they had problems and you do not modify that in your RFP, you're probably going to encounter the same problem. So well, past RFPs can help shorten your, your workload for developing your solicitation. It can also cause you to actually inherit the same problems if you don't really change it so that it's an improvement on the original. Better product had good functionality at the end of it. That's great. That's really what you want to look for. But again, know what the RFP says, know what it's asking for, and, and find out what troubles they had with it initially. Uh, certainly, one of the more common strategies is to talk to vendors who, who may have the product. I, I would never discourage this. This is something that you, you have to do because most likely you're not going to know what they know about the product and you need to you need to get a baseline understanding. So with that said, I, I want you to be wary because um, they do like to provide the technical specifications for you. In fact, most vendors do it as not just technology. You, you, you may buy a bus. Uh, you know, whatever it is that you're looking to buy, if they have a specification that kind of leads them, leads you down their road, they're going to provide it to you. Uh, and again, they do have off-the-shelf products that they're trying to push with those specs. So uh, you want to read them carefully, know what they're saying, and, and clean them so that they meet your need. Uh, the IPS architecture process, again, it, it provides insight to the technology already in existence um, and may be useful. Some of these, uh, they already have options available. Now, ITS architecture, generally you can't have a lot of options on a procurement. It has to meet your own personal needs within the, the life of the, the technology. But occasionally you might get lucky and find that um, there's one or two options on a contract for a product that will help you and meet your needs. Again, in that situation, you you are stuck with what you buy. You really can't modify the current uh, to meet your needs afterwards. Uh, lastly, understand that federal procurement standards apply. You want to document your processes um, and be prepared for you know, an order down the road uh, for anything involving technology or any procurement for that matter. Uh, that's really all I have. That, those are my experiences. Um, looking forward to hearing yours. So, uh, Rob, if you want to start the conversation, let's get to it. Yes. Um, thank you, Mike. Thank you for the presentation. Um, right now, it's really open uh, for discussion. I don't know whether uh, Frank or Curtis has a couple of uh, things they'd like to, to uh, put in. We do have some folks that are raising their hand as well. Uh, Frank and Curtis, or Curtis. Hi, Rob. This is Curtis, SCDOT. I, I kind of just wanted to see if Mike could, uh, he mentioned about getting assistance, but you have to be careful about proprietary spec. Also, uh, how about getting their assistance with the independent estimate? That's one of the things that we found. Um, beneficial working with the manufacturers on is trying to get that independent estimate and the scope together, but he is correct that you have to be kind of careful how you do that. Yeah, this is Frank. About the only thing I could add to what Mike presented was the importance of getting references from your potential vendors when you collect your request for proposals. You know, the references the vendor is never going to offer as a reference somebody who's going to say something bad about their product. But we were able to use those references to identify live deployments of similar software in markets similar to ours so that we could actually visit and see how the product performed in the real world. And without that, my guess is we would have ended up another trapeze or route match shop 
rather than having software that really met our needs. So the references were really important, but not for the reasons that you commonly think. Okay, thanks, Frank. Um, Mike Curtis had a question. Or he was looking for. Yeah, I, I, I didn't really understand. He was breaking up a lot. Could he repeat that, please? Yes, Mike. My question was regarding uh, involving the manufacturers and helping you come to the develop the independent estimate. Because a lot of times when you start, you don't have a complete idea of what the scope is going to be. So do you have any suggestions on that without getting too caught up in only specifying what uh, the, that manufacturer provides? Well, so, so you're referring to the independent cost estimate process? Yes. Correct. Right. And you're, you're trying to achieve numbers by calling vendors, correct? Well, what, do you have any other suggestions on how to get to, through that process without just involving the, the vendors that you're going to be soliciting quotes from? Uh, yeah, certainly I would, I would look to your peers who have acquired something similar. I would look at uh, state purchasing schedules and state contracts that might have something similar to it on the, uh, you know, uh, on their contracts. Um, but yeah, for the most part, a lot of agencies will look to the vendors to get a ballpark price. I, I don't have any problem with that. I, I don't believe FTA does. You're, you're not getting into anything in the procurement process at this point. You're simply trying to secure numbers to justify why you're going to ask for you know, local math support uh, for federal funding and ultimately a grant process. So you're just justifying why you're asking for that money. I think if you're going to go strictly with vendors, you probably want to be pretty clear about what you're looking to purchase. Um, and, and it's not always that they'll share those prices with you. So if you're finding out that they, they are, that's good. Um, but that, that's what I would say at this point. Check check with your peers, check with state purchasing schedules, um, and do your outreach as best you can. Hey, okay. Thank you. Um, any Neil, I think, Neil, do you have anybody with a raised hand that we can bring in? Yeah, we'll start with uh, Mr. Max Calder. I'm going to mute him to see if he has a question. Actually, I Max? didn't intentionally raise my hand. This is Max Calder with Span Denton County. I do have a comment, though. I would echo what um, the uh, one of the previous commentators was talking about with the specification. We are in kick the tires phase mode right now. Uh, the North Central Texas Council of Governments will be doing the procurement on our behalf and some other uh, smaller providers. But we've gone through a phase where we researched the industry, and I'm from Southern California, very familiar with trapeze, route match, and, and the big players. Looking around the industry, though, and listening to the narrative, that there is a lot out there that I wasn't aware of, am aware of now, and you can remove price from the picture. Kind of the, the thought I have for the RFP from a scope of work standpoint is more narrative than specification to truly let the industry just talk about not only how they're going to implement and train, but how they're going to code the system to be open-ended, open able to be integrated, and all those good things from ability management. So um, I'm agreeing with the, the, that risk that uh, was mentioned a couple different times um, of you know vendors being more than willing to give you a standard spec, but that can almost become a de facto sole source and all you're getting is something off the shelf. Good points, definitely. Thanks, Max. Okay, the next uh, hand is uh, by Ray Blamer. And I'm going to unmute you now. Hello, Ray? It uh, looks like Ray um, may not be near his phone. Um, okay. I did have somebody type in a question about mentioning the challenges with uh, Buy America or sole source procurement. Mike, whether you wanted to mention that for a sec. I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that, Rob. You just had um, you know, the challenges of Buy America and sole source procurement. I know that that could probably take a half hour in itself. In, in general or regarding IT? Um, first of all, Buy America, uh, 
in the IT world would apply to um, manufactured products, you know, being a uh, steel or, or iron product. And I'm, I'm not sure why it's a big lift. Um, there's, there's a lot of technology available in the states, and, and it, it certainly is a, it's a big lift for the FDA because they want to see that when they, when they review. But I'm not sure it's a big lift for technology, and a lot of times it will not even be applicable um, because most, most technology will not have steel or iron products uh, within them. But if they do, yes, it is applicable, and you would have to follow it. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question or not. I'm not really understanding the concern. Hey, Mike, okay. uh, the person who asked had their hand raised. I think they just took it down, so I think you answered the question. Okay. Oh, it's back up, so I'm going to mute uh, Mr. Dan Mundy. Hello, Dan. Hi. <clears throat> um, this is Dan Mundy. I'm actually with Cal Act, which is a, one of the state associations in California. My question is regard to... There are no, to my knowledge, no IT equipment that's made or assembled or parts made from the U.S. So are you saying that is not an issue for a procurement where uh, FDA is looking for meeting by America? I don't, I don't see um, the concern with by America. I, I thought there was plenty of technology to purchase in the in the U.S. There's what none that I'm aware of. Technology are you referring to? Any technology. I do not know of any piece of uh, electronic equipment that is manufactured in the U.S. From fare boxes to computers to where the parts you know, would meet the 60% domestic requirement. You would have to go, in, at least uh, my expectation is that you would have to go to FTA for a waiver, which um, is unlikely to get. I was under the impression technologies were not um, applicable to Buy America, but I'll have to look at that more. Did you send out a note to us if you find that listing anywhere? I will. Is there anybody um, on the on the call who can chime in on that? That would be interesting to hear. Um, Mike, but, we're yeah. doing raise hand, so we're not really sure. But, <laughs> um, maybe, maybe somebody. Okay, so I'm just. Well, I'm going to unmute the next uh, the next person who had their hands raised. His name is uh, Mr. Larry Kaminsky. Hello, Larry. You on? Y yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, um, and hi, Mike. Um, we've been acquainted for quite some time through the New York State DOT. I am from the Western New York region as well, and um, again, in the process of acquiring IT technology for our fleet vehicles, also. And we've had um, as well some recent experience through uh, the procurement of uh, what we had um, identified at the time as mobility management software. That, unfortunately for us. Um, it kind of failed us miserably, but it it was as well a learning experience in which we were trying to build out from uh, with regard to this procurement. My question is, though, um, uh, through the research that I'm doing with um, with other vendors, with vendors that are providing this IT product and other users of this technology as well, what we were initiating with, with a technology that we were basing upon an agency type of owned environment, we're now um, coming to discover is not such a good practice any longer. Rather, um, uh, a lot of recommendations are coming to us to say, at the very minimum, have a provider hosted environment. And even further from that, maybe, um, um, our agency, uh, again, based on uh, experiences with so many recent updates to the service, uh, should consider something of a leased or a non-owned product, if you would, uh, so that we have the ability to update as the industry uh, uh, evolves and we don't become um, kind of uh, stuck in the mud, so to say, with a product that perhaps could uh, become uh, obsolete over time. Any thoughts on your part on, on uh, those particular um, uh, 
industry suggestions in which we pan? Well, you're, you're talking about cloud-based um, technology for the most part, right, Larry? Well, initially we were, again, talking about an, uh, an agency host server, agency host uh, on vehicle products, and, of course, um, agency managed um, reporting and, um, uh, you know, other types of day-to-day -day operation uh, um, deliverables. But, uh, again, I, I, what I'm being told is, um, again, the, the, again, I'm not any kind of an IT technician to begin with. And so there's some inherent challenges with that. But what I'm being told also is that uh, uh, you shouldn't rely on something from, from a local standpoint to manage those aspects any longer. Uh, even, again, within the, the products themselves, as far as the uh, onboard computers and um, driver interaction um, um, screens, um, even from, from the desktops that are going into our mobility management office and. Uh, administrative offices uh, this should be something that should be considered again as a again at the minimum now uh, a provider hosted environment cloud-based as you'd suggested or even further uh, uh, a leased type of a situation which is completely managed by the provider in which the agency would essentially provide a service fee to receive now again, depending on your answer here I've got some follow-up questions on that too well, it sounds like you've been talking to vendors who, are, who may offer cloud-based services. Um, so they're certainly going to, to push that. Uh, I'm an advocate for cloud-based services uh, because it is easier. You don't have to have the infrastructure on site. You obviously will have a, an ongoing hosting and maintenance fee. Um, that, that could be problematic if, if you don't get some type of escalator uh, knowledge of, of what that could be. Server technology on site. Obviously, you you have to maintain that stuff. You have to keep it up. Can also still come with uh, licensing fees and and uh, various maintenance and support fees. If you're asking me, would I go in one direction or another? I would probably point you to some of the problems in the mobility management world right now, where a lot of uh, agencies are outsourcing this type of uh, not not so much technology in the mobility management world, obviously, but, but even call management. Uh, from that standpoint, they're using their their outsourcing capabilities, and you know there may be a mobility management consortium in, in your area that is being managed by a firm in Cincinnati. So you tend to get disconnected from that. So there's uh, pros and cons um, to having it on site um, versus having it off site, without question. Again, I'm an advocate for cloud-based technology, but understand that firm could be in Japan, it could be in uh, Cincinnati, it could be in Mexico. You never know. Um, it, it, there's problems both ways, you know. Well, to follow up on this now, if again, now, and again, it is now our intention that we lean towards a, a hosted environment. Um, our, um, our funding request was initially uh, posed as uh, again an agency hosted environment with a lot of capitalized costs that we had received an approval on. Uh, with now this change in our intentions, our, 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 our costs are now you know somewhat being converted into type of operational costs rather than uh, a capital expense at this point. And um, we're, we're forced with this. We're, we're dealing now with a situation how how to perhaps reallocate our resources, or, or perhaps change our philosophy altogether based on the the uh, maybe restrictions that we have with our funding. Sorry, you went from an eighty cents on a dollar program to a fifty cents on a dollar program. Is what you're telling right. me, right? Yes. Um, but but even after your initial expenses, Larry. Uh, for your current technology, um, you had hosting and maintenance still occurring, correct? Yes. And, and that too would have been an operational expense. Maybe I don't understand your question. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right in what you said there. It's just that the, the ongoing expenses will be increasing and the initial outlay will be 
decreasing as a result of this. Those, those were not not items in which we were originally anticipating. Sure. Okay. Uh, so, what's so, your underlying question? I, I guess it's not necessarily a question. It's just something in which I, I suppose I share as a comment to to, uh, to illustrate uh, a challenge in which we're dealing with uh, with this tra transition in which we've made here. Okay, and, and is your transition in, in uh, full movement now? Food. Is your transition um, in full movement? Well, the the RFP has not been launched yet, but um, again, it's being built out to the extent of uh, um, very explicit explanation on uh, uh, on what the, those intentions will be, and of course, uh, our responses would so come, come in accordingly. So you're you're anticipating higher costs. You don't actually know that yet. Correct. Okay. Hey, Mike, it's Tom, Rob Frank Thomas. Oh, oh, go ahead, Frank. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No. Please continue. Go ahead, Frank. Okay, I do have a follow-up sort of in that same vein I'd love to get your opinion on. We are agency hosted. You know, we're, our server is right across the room from me. I'm driving 20 mobile data computers over three counties with GIS capabilities over eight. And we have it on our own server because, frankly, we want the data. We want to be able to write custom reports, and we're sort of nerds like that. The downside, of course, is that if anything happens to me, if I get hit by one of my buses this afternoon, all of the things I've built fall apart real fast because there just aren't a lot of people in my agency that understand it. So having a cloud or uh, vendor-hosted option, does that, have you found, I mean, you're an advocate for cloud-based. Have you found that the access to the data is there and the ability to manipulate the data using MySQL or you know, Microsoft Report Builder, whatever you have, is that, is that doable? The, the power that I want locally, is that doable in a cloud-based solution? Yes, I, I, I've dealt with technologies um, that you know, certainly allow you to export your data. Um, in CVS format or, or whatever format you prefer, it, it's generally CVS. Um, into an Excel format, sometimes out to PDF, which is a little more more difficult to work with. Um, but but certainly, when I look at cloud-based technology, I want to know that ownership is mine. Ownership of the data is mine, and I can get it anytime I want. Uh, and, and some um, back to the ITS technology. Some of the ITS technologies are very proprietary and can be difficult to get the, the data you want. And sometimes will require you purchase additional technology from the same firm to be able to do that. Um, so yes, right. the, answer, the short answer is yes, you can, um, but it, it requires research, because I'm sure there are agencies out there that are proprietary. You're not going to get to see their algorithm, obviously, but you should be able to get right. your data. You should be able to manipulate I, your data on the fly. I totally don't want to dominate the conversation, but since you mentioned ITS, may I ask you a quick follow-up on that as well? Sure. Okay. As ITS continues to evolve and the needs of a small transit system like mine have to start meeting community infrastructure like you know, dynamic traffic signaling, collision avoidance, cooperative road systems, things like that, how do you recommend that at the time of procurement we try to allow for some of those compatibility standards that I'm not necessarily facing today, but in the five-year useful life of this procurement, I need to start preparing for? I couldn't even begin to answer that question. That's way out of my my skill set. Um, are are you saying both. <laughs> what's that? Yours and mine both. Are Are you saying that the technology is advancing so quickly that in five years your technology will be outdated and you'll need to yeah. acquire something new? Or that my vendor is going to have to upgrade the existing technology because I mean the the thing that I'm looking at is like dynamic traffic signaling. I would love it if my fixed route vehicle never saw another red light as long as I live. <laughs> but my, I know that my current software won't handle it. I don't have the, the proper little strobe lights that you know, trigger an ITS signal that allows me to go through the intersection. I mean, stuff like that that is coming with cooperative road systems and 
and things that our tech is going to have to interface with long term. I know it's not here yet, but as my community builds out, those things are coming, and I feel like I'm being left behind. No, I, I understand. I mean, I, I see it now with um, agencies still purchasing AVLs when you have GPS and uh, um, smartphone technology that can do the same thing as uh, the AVLs do. Um, you know, so some purchase AVLs. Yeah, exactly. You know, it, 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 I feel your pain. I, I honestly don't have the skill sets to touch base on something uh, as complex as you're talking about. Um, so all I could advise you to do would be uh, continue to research, um, try to understand what innovations are out there and what's going to hit in five years. But that's difficult. Uh, you know, you have you have a job to do, and, and right. studying and, and technologies is, certainly can't be a high priority on your list at this point. Okay, thanks, gentlemen. <laughs> um, I just thought that maybe we could answer some questions that people have typed in via chat. Um, and for Mike, um, we are all aware of those nasty support agreements after the sale. How far in advance can we purchase support agreements? Three, five, ten years? I think that would depend on your, your RFP, um, how you drafted that RFP. Uh, I do know that a lot of a lot of RFPs are drafted, uh, you know, for like a, a three-year contract. And within that three-year contract, they've included the cost for maintenance and support. And then after that contract ends, you are um, kind of dependent on them because you're not going to get rid of the software. I think I mentioned that before. Um, the software is still going to continue its life in your in your system. Mm -hmm. And if you if you didn't include an escalator clause or something in your in your original agreement that said after after the three years are up. What are, what are the anticipated increases annually in your, your hosting and maintenance fees, your licensing fees, something where they would put, and, and it's still not binding because the contract ends, but at least they would understand that you're concerned about the long-term agreements of your contract. Um, I, I think it's something you have to address within your original RFP, uh, maybe in your price list. But you say that the, uh, the first three years of the agreement includes maintenance and support um, for the life of our our use of the product. What would be the maximum escalator per year for the licensing fee? So, you know, something like that. How do you how do you get an agency to say oh, we're not going to triple the cost on, on year four? Um, make it part of the RFP so that they understand it's a concern and if they want to win the bid, you know, they might start to look at something like that and say we won't increase it more than five percent a year or whatever it may be. Um, might be might be an approach you want to take. Is that any help? Well, this was typed in, so we'll find out if they type back in. Neil, do you have any uh, raised hand person? Yes, there's one more. Uh, Valerie Schultz, I'm unmuting you. Hello, Valerie. You have a Hello. I did a little research on the Buy America website, and under Appendix A, which is their Buy America waivers, or sorry, Appendix C. They have microcomputer equipment, including software from a foreign source, which is exempt from the Buy America right requirements. Right, that's part of the Buy America clause, um, usually within the first couple sentences. I think what the gentleman was questioning was, wasn't so much software, but the hardware. Um, he was questioning Fairbox, Fairbox casing, which is usually a heavy steel. Um, you know, the, what it's built out of, not so much software, but the hardware that it's built out of. I think that was his question. Okay. So, but I, I appreciate that. That is definitely part of the uh, biomedical the clause, the, the waiver for software. Thank you, Valerie. Um, Mike, maybe if we can go to a chat question. Let me just see what I have. Um, this is probably a, this will be quick. I am not. Oh, forget. Um, can you go out for an an RFP for IT consultant? Uh, sure. Under services, is that correct? 
Uh, yeah, under professional services, you're, you're looking to hire a consultant um, to do the work for you. You're not, you're not buying you're, you're not buying materials and supplies and doing it yourself. You're hiring somebody to do it for you. That would be professional services. Neil, do we have any raised hands? Uh, if not, no, we do not. Chat stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. Can you discuss how to build RFPs that address the need for a web-based technology to provide the agency with the ownership and access to their data? Have we? We. I know we discussed that. Um, uh, could, could you repeat that? Okay. Um, Actually, what I'm going to do, Mike, is send it to you. Hold on. Okay, I'm sending it to you via chat. And can while you're reading it. How? Yep, go ahead. Yes, can you discuss that? A so the RFPs are addressed the need for web-based technology that provide the agency with ownership and access to their data. Um, I would put that within your technical specifications. You want to make it clear that um, the data that is contained within the program, you want ownership to it. Uh, you want the ability to export that. Um, and utilize it at, at will. Uh, you want the ability to manipulate it, whether it's uh, you know, edit, delete, and so on. I mean, it's not it's not a big lift. Uh, there are plenty of web-based technologies out there that understand that ownership is important, and and there are a lot of free technologies out there that understand that. That you wouldn't even have to pay for it. But, but generally, when you're dealing with government, they they're very careful about what they allow you to acquire. So yeah, as far as building the RFP, put that within your technical specifications for um, uh, non-proprietary nature of, of software that allows you uh, full ownership and access to your, your data, um, editing, downloading 24-7. Language, a very simple language um, within your RFP. Once they sign it, they understand that you're asking that. and. Uh, have access to that. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, and just to let everybody know, the slides as well as the uh, discussion is being recorded. Um, what we can do too is send the slides out to the folks who attended this um, this peer call. Um, what I'm trying to do is, I still have some people in chat. Can you please take more or talk more about the national ITS architecture requirements or resources to better understand them? I can chat send this to you, Mike, too. Please talk more about the ITS architecture requirements, resources. Um, the ITS architecture policy, uh, generally, it, it's um, it's a requirement to understand what is being implemented. The participating agencies, um, you know, their roles and responsibilities, the requirements of the, the programs, configuration, technology options, um, financing, and procurement options. Essentially, it, it's a it's a way to support regional integration. You do not want to, well, the FTA does not want agencies and businesses and government um, just out there developing software without communicating with each other um, and finding out at the end of the day nobody can talk to each other. Uh, there's just no compatibility. So it really was an initiative to make people think about the technology that they're buying from a regional standpoint. A, a lot of it goes to uh, if you if you think about your uh, your local emergency response uh, setup within your own communities, uh, that requires transportation, uh, police, 
fire, highway, all to be able to react in a quick and efficient manner. A lot of this is done by a technology now. And if, if transit is purchasing software um, to move their vehicles around to um, allow people to, to understand where they are and how many more minutes before they arrive at their stop and so on, um, in an emergency response situation, police and fire and, and uh, agencies like that will be reaching out to the transit agency as well. If they pay attention to the regional ITS architecture, which is a subset of the federal ITS architecture, there's, there are good chances that they can communicate better, um, more efficiently, and quicker, providing that response in an efficient manner that they could possibly save lives. That, that's the reason for the architecture policy in the first place. I believe it was implemented back like in 2005 or so. Um, but, but that's those are the components of, of what they're looking for. And it's to provide regional integration. Um, you know, it should be an, an institutional success, really, when you look at ITS architecture. If it's if it's paid attention to, um, and and really assessed from a, a regional standpoint. And, and I know there there was one gentleman on who who went through this um, several years back, and he he went to the regional. Uh, the Department of Transportation got a hold of their regional ITS architecture and was able to see what various agencies had implemented. And, and from that standpoint, he performed a uh, system engineering process, which allowed him to understand what the participating agencies had and, and his ability to communicate with them or not. And if you can't communicate with somebody, that's fine. At least you know that. And you know that you're picking up a phone when a situation arises. You're not going to be able to do it with technology. But that's what the research is about, and that's the reason for uh, ITS architecture. Okay, I think that um, we're probably coming to a closing, uh, mainly because there are people dropping out, and we have been on the phone for about an hour. Um, Mike, what I'm going to do is just uh, move the screen back to us, um, and Neil, I'm going to switch it over to you if we can just see your the remaining slides um, which I not seeing oh here we go okay if you could bring it down to the slide after conversation and it's really, um, I think that the discussion um, has been really good. Anybody that has a question that we weren't able to answer, um, we'll forward those questions to Mike to get an answer. Um, National RTAP, as well as Mike, will um, discuss, I mean, we'll research that question about um, Buy America for more hardware than software as it deals with um, technology equipment on the on the bus. I want to thank Mike Labello um, for his presentation um, and as well as Frank Thomas and Curtis Sims for their input as well during this discussion. I hope everybody was able to get their questions out. Certainly if you still have questions about procurement, um, sir, you can email us. Um, Neil, if you want to go to the next slide or you can attend the webinar that we're holding on June the 15th, 2016 at 2.30 Eastern Daylight Time. Um, we are having uh, Ryan Hammond, he's with uh, FTA Region 8, to talk about the procurement basics. Many of the things that Mike had, had presented uh, during this presentation, but Ryan will also be talking about some of the findings that they see uh, via the audits that uh, FTA performs. And then Mike will also be presenting on some case studies as well as talking about Procurement Pro and how Procurement Pro may be at least able to help you out in determining what your federal clauses and certifications are uh, based on the procurement that you're, you're planning on doing. Um, as well as um, certainly Procurement Pro has a number of checklists that uh, help you through the procurement process. 
Uh, next slide, Neil. Thank you. Um, we do procure, uh, we do peer calls. Um, usually, they're the third Wednesday of every other month at two thirty. In the event that you do have some subject matter that you'd like to have discussed during the peer calls, um, you can either um, put that in a question right now, or you can um, certainly um, provide information during the post-call survey that you automatically get as part of participating in this peer call. And of course, you can go on to either uh, our Facebook or onto our website and just email us via there at info at nationalrtap.org. Um, but we'd also we'd like to hear from you um, to see if there are any other subject matter that you would like to hear during the peer to peer. Um, at this time, once again, I'd like to thank Mike for his presentation and for Frank and Curtis for for participating. Um, you have been listening to National RTAP. Um, my contact information and Neil contact information is here, as well as uh, don't forget about our website and our web page. And I want to thank everybody for participating and hope that you have a great rest of the main day. Thank you very much.